Um, so just like a quick kind of recap of what we discussed last time, I'm going to kind of go quickly through this, but um, basically we talked about workflow and projects. We talked about some, uh, we did a lot of stuff with workflow and projects that we, that's where we spent the majority of our time. And then we talked about data wrangling, the introduction part of it, which was just basically the, the data science workflow. And it was really, really, really short. And then we were talking about tibbles and that's where we left off last time. And so um, the, I, I posted the old kind of slides up so you can kind of review them again. So, but a couple things that we went over, we talked about a project oriented workflow. We talked about, um, you know, why we should care about that kind of workflow and thinking about our workflow. And I actually had to bring up an example about this because my boss actually today emailed me and said, hey, you remember this report that you ran like two years ago? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, I need you to run it again. And I opened it up and I was like, man, I wish I knew what I knew now two years ago <laughs> because I was spending a lot of time going back and, and, and being like, man, I should have wrote this a lot better. So anyways, uh, so it's important. So from my perspective, it's important to think about it. Uh, we talked about what's real from our analysis. We talked about some ways to kind of remind us. I uh, shared just a funny uh, meme with you about your files. Um, talked about file systems and how that kind of works and talking about relatives and absolute paths. Uh, we talked about avoiding set WD if you can. Uh, we talked about some strong opinions in the R community about it. Um, but again, it's your workflow. You can do whatever you want and how you want to kind of structure your project, but it's kind of the accepted way. We talked about R Studio projects. Uh, for some of you, uh, you set up your first project, which is awesome. Um, some other people, I kind of helped you diagnose that, which was great. And then we talked about creating uh, your studio project. Then we discussed our notebooks. And my question is, is how many of you have used our notebooks since our last conversation? Anybody? And actually, I discovered I discovered something today. It's just that because I use notebook, but uh, it's good for uh, writing, debugging, stuff like that. But at the end, I wanted a script. And there is a way to pull after all the chunk into a script because at the, yes, yeah, so I just, it's just something I found out today that, uh, yes, after you could, you could just have a script with all your chunk and it could be easier because our notebook is really easy to debug because you could run uh, chunk by chunk. Oh, that's, that's excellent. I mean, if we have some time afterwards, I'm gonna have to ask you to show me that because that sounds, uh, that sounds very useful. So I didn't know that, but cool, awesome. So if you haven't yet, like I said, I'm an advocate. Obviously, during our time, I, I advocated as it being an awesome notebook. And so um, hopefully you kind of incorporate that in your workflows if you can. So tonight, uh, then we talked about chapter nine, which was basically the uh, data science workflow. Uh, I really like this visualization. Anytime that I discuss data science or kind of what I do in my day-to-day -day job, this is what I show people. I say, this is basically what I do. and. Um, this whole chapter was going to talk about the wrangling portion. We're going to talk about tidy today. Next week, we'll talk about importing. And then um, tidy and transforming will kind of be the next steps where we'll kind of go next. And so here's some of the stuff that we'll talk about in this kind of section of the book. Um, tonight, we'll talk about data wrangling concepts, specifically with tibbles. Um, data import next week, and then tidy data, which Ryan said he would kind of talk about. And then we'll start talking about data transformation. So working with different data types, um, relational data, strings, factors, dates, and times. And so um, we'll talk more about that kind of in the coming weeks. So let's talk a little bit about Tibbles, the chapter 10. So hopefully that was kind of a good review, kind of got us a little caught up in thinking about what we're going to talk about tonight. But let's just kind of define what a Tibble is. And the good news, we've already been working with them. So uh, uh, secretly, you've been kind of working with them. Uh, pretty much if you use the Tidyverse, uh, you are using Tibbles. And if you read kind of, I came across this, uh, this old vignette. And vignette's just a documentation that gets included with some of these packages. I was reading it about the Tidyverse. And it basically lays out that Tibbles are at the foundation of every Tidyverse function. And so, and the reason why we use Tidyverse or why we use Tibbles and Tidyverse is because it makes things easier. And one thing you'll come across when you start reading the next week's chapter 
um, not importing data, but tidy data, the tidyverse really tries to make things simple. And one way to make that simple is to use tibbles. Now, tibbles are closely related to a base R, a base R object called a data.frame. Um, so I'm thinking of Morgan, who probably 10 years ago was working with R, he probably worked with data.frame. Uh, in the tidyverse, it transforms it into what's called a, a tibble. And so it's just basically a data structure that is adapted from a data frame. And I really kind of thought some of these quotes were interesting, uh, you know, talking about how they're different from data frames. And tibbles are basically data frames, but they tweak some old behaviors to make things a little bit easier. And so some things like how it's outputted to the console, what it looks like, um, allowing you to see different types of information about your data. Uh, it also does some things like, this is different now, but a long time ago, it used to, it used to convert strings to factors. Um, that's changed ever since uh, R has been updated. But previously, data frames, when you used to import data, anything that was character or string data automatically got turned to a factor. And so we'll talk a little bit about that today, but um, it's no more an issue anymore. Uh, some other things that people said, tibbles provide a stricter checking and better formatting than traditional data frames. And what was nice about it is uh, this kind of quote kind of labeled this for me is the general ethos is that tibbles are lazy and surly. They do less and they complain more than the base R dot data frame. And so it simplifies things for you, but it's also very, very opinionated. Opinionated being that it, it requires a certain structure to use. But the reason why it has that kind of structure is because you know when you pass a tibble through different tidyverse functions, you know it's going to work. And so um, that's kind of like at the core of the foundation of it is just getting a data structure that works throughout all of the tidyverse or at the foundation of all tidyverse functions. Okay. So let's kind of observe these properties. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I haven't outputted this in this, but if you wouldn't mind opening up your um, opening up your R Studio and actually kind of run some of these functions um, and run some of these objects and functions and kind of look at it and let's just kind of talk about some of the differences that you see between a data frame and a tibble. Example one is a data frame, and example two is a tibble. And so, and we'll talk more about what these functions do. But if you wouldn't mind just typing these in, uh, you can type them directly in your console or if you're using a notebook, you can uh, type them in a notebook code chunk and then look at it from there. So I'll give you, I'll give you about a minute or two to kind of type those in. And then we'll kind of talk about the differences and then I'll walk through each one of these steps here. When you're ready, you can just give me a thumbs up. And everybody can see this. Do I need to bump it up any larger? No. Okay, we're good. Okay. I'll give you about 30 more seconds. So let's kind of talk about this just a little bit. Um, what are some of the differences that you see? The first one, this empty cars is going to be a data frame. And then this empty cars tibble is going to be a tibble. What are some of the differences that you see?
Um, on the on the bottom one, is it class MT cars or is it class MT cars underscore TBL? Ah, uh, you're you're right. So I did accidentally mess that up. So that should have been MT cars TBL. That's my fault. Excuse yeah. me about that. No worries. No worries. Okay. So what well, we could talk about what some of these do here first before we talk about the differences. So if you ran class, um, class basically is just a, is a function that you can use as a base R function that tells you what the object actually is. And so what's nice about this, and I'm going to do this here real quick. I'm going to go class, and I'll show you my my uh, R Studio here in a second. So class empty cars. What's nice about this is it will actually tell you the object. It's, that's a data frame, so everybody can see my studio, correct? Okay, so, um, but so I have this empty cars tibble, which is actually a tibble. If you type in class and you go empty cars underscore tibble, which I should have had changed in my notes, um, you can see that it is technically, it's technically considered three different types or three different classes. It still contains that data frame, data dot frame class but it adds these other type of attributes to the actual object to kind of do this kind of functionality and to work with, um, to work with, you know, tidyverse functions. And I've always thought this was kind of interesting because a tibble isn't just a new object, it's a modification of a data.frame. So it still could be used and, and it's, it could still be used for in other packages that don't use uh, a tibble per se, but we'll talk about ways to convert it back and forth. But one way that you can always convert it back and forth is it still contains that kind of attribute of a data dot frame. So it's just a modification. So it can do those kind of functionality things for tidyverse packages. So what were some of the thing? What were some differences that you saw between um, just a like a data dot frame and a data tibble? Or tibble, excuse me. The first one I saw was that there were those three, and I didn't understand those until you explained them just now. So it's a data dot frame. It's a TBL. That's the tibble class. Mm -hmm. And then there's a TBL underscore DF, which is some kind of hybrid of a tibble and a data frame. Yeah. So it's a different type of attribute. It's like an attribute that gets added to the class. So um, it's, I could dig more into it. I'm not 100% sure, but it allows for some of this functionality of how it's printed and then how it works with other tidyverse um, functions as well. As the best way I understand it. What else? What are what are some of the the things that what are some other things that you notice that were different between a data frame and a tibble? It's the same data, empty cards. It's the same data. We're just changing it into a different format. I think for me, the biggest difference between the two that I see is, is that when you just do the MT cars data frame, look at the printout itself. Um, when you first run it, you get just this large chunk of output. And so it's, it's just the entire data set gets printed to your console. And if you have a data frame, uh, data frame object, it will print out up to about, I think a thousand rows. And so it kind of clutters up your console. But when you look at a tibble, the printing is different. And so what are some of these things that you see in the tibble printout? What are some things that you see that are different? Uh, data frame doesn't tell you the number of rows and columns, which the tibble does in the starting. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. So. What's nice about this kind of like what they call pretty printing is it gives you the dimensions of your data set. And so it's telling you how many, um, how many columns, you know, how many rows and then how many columns. And so it kind of quickly tells you, you can kind of get a quick look, say, okay, I have 32 rows in this data set. And then I have 11 columns or 11 variables in this data set that I can, you know, do some type of analysis on. So that's a good one. That's a great one. What else? What are some of the things that you see that are different between the two? Yeah, the columns have, have types listed out. Yeah, and I think that's an excellent, I, I love this feature because you can actually see what 
the different data types are. We'll talk more about data types, you know, later on, but it's really nice that an actual tibble tells us what type of data it is. And so it kind of helps us do a quick view of this. Um, so you can also, the other function that I showed you is table.sum. I didn't know this function before, but was, but this is a, uh, a, a it's kind of like class, but to look at like different to just, it's kind of like class, but if you go tibble sum and you can run this on a data frame like MT cars, it will just tell you some information about that it's a data frame, give you the dimensions of the data frame. And then the same thing if you do tibble sum on the MT cars tibble object, it will just tell you it's a tibble 32 by 11. I don't know, it's, it's kind of like class, the information is already provided to you, but I thought it was kind of neat to have that as well. Okay. So uh, any questions about like the definition of a tibble? Any questions about how to check its class? Any, any questions regarding that? Okay. So let's talk about creating tibbles. Uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, so if you have a data frame, so empty cars, you saw that we use this function called as underscore tibble. You can use that on a data frame object to actually create your data frame into a tibble or, or to transform it into a tibble. Um, the other thing that the book talked about is you can create your own tibbles using vectors. Uh, vectors basically being the actual columns themselves that you specify in it. Uh, when you look at this, uh, there's going to be three different columns that are created, X, Y, Z. One vector is going to be one through five. Somebody tell me what's going to be the Y vector in this case, or what's going to be the Y variable? It is a vector, but what's Y going to be in this, this tibble? One will be repeated five times. Yep, and this is excellent because that's excellent. Yep, because it's there's recycling rules that tibbles follow. And so because we have a, uh, a vector of one through five here, it will recycle this one vector right here. And so we'll actually when we see it, it will be uh, five ones built on that. And then Z is just transforming it using these two variables and we would still have five different columns or five different rows as well. And so we have a three by five, we'll basically get a three by five tibble in this. But two things that you wanna know about this is you can specify your own tibbles by putting vectors together and the recycling rules. And this is important, and I should have put this in the notes here, but the recycling rules are important because what's nice about this is if you use a mutate function, if you put a value into that mutate function, it will use that recycling rule to fill every single row with that one value. And so um, it's kind of a nice little feature if you just need to like do a repeating value in, in, one, co or in one column. So that's, that's a really nice feature of the two. Uh, the book talks about a triple. Um, I really didn't understand. I understood what it was, but I don't necessarily understand the reason why you would want to do this. Um, I don't know, does anybody have any examples or have any idea where you might use a triple? I used them at the beginning because uh, I hadn't yet switched over in my mind the idea of creating horizontal columns, if you know what I mean. Like when you do it as a tibble, <clears throat> you make each vector, you write each vector out horizontally. And in my mind, I hadn't yet switched it over to the idea that those become the columns. Um, and so I did, just as I was experimenting around, I started with the tribbles because it was easier for me to, to key in values the way that I expected to see them, um, like with vertical columns. Um, but now as, as time has gone over and, and my mind has you know, gotten a little bit better at this, the making the, doing it the Tibble way is, is straightforward for me now. Yeah, I, I, yeah that, that's a good point. I never thought about that, thinking about like getting it to represent how we would expect it, like the Excel sheet view. Yeah. Um, 
I thought of it for like maybe like quick data entry or something. Like if you were creating like a table to, I don't know, to do like a join on or something with, I was like, oh, well, if you need like a quick table to do a join, maybe. But other than that, I didn't really see a use case for it. But if anybody else has one, you know, chime in definitely, or, you know, uh, just add to it. But yeah, I think that's a good point. I never thought about that, that it helps us kind of think about how, how we expect data to look. I just have a question. Do you know if it's possible to create a empty table? Mm, empty that? with just just something empty with just the name of the variable. Oh, an empty table. Um, yes, empty table. Yes, something. Yeah. I think there is. I think you can just do like I think, and somebody can chime in if they if they have an answer. I think you can just do table, can't you? And then X is an empty table, right? Yeah, but you don't have the name of the variable because I try to create something with a table X equal new. You know, I just that sometimes I like to begin with something fresh, something completely empty, and after to fill my table, but at least to define everything at the beginning. Hmm. I mean, I well, the one thing I'm thinking. Oh well. No, but it was just, no, it was just a question because. Uh, I, I like to begin with uh, to set up my data at the beginning on yeah. empty something empty. Why don't you can you try um, x assign um, and then vector? Oh, so like uh, like vector like the function vector? Yep, yeah, vector function, and then I think don't you may, you say what kind it is like you. Would, do quotation double or quotation character or something. Oh, I don't know. I might have, do, do you have an example? And then comma. Comma. And then you specify how long you want it, maybe 100 or 10 or something. And then, so after you create that, maybe, maybe mm, spell out double instead of. Oh, double? Yeah. So now if you make a, a you turn that into a tibble. X, so we'll turn this into a tibble, so we'll just name it Y, tibble, tibble, X, and Y. Okay. You might be able to do something like that. I, I To be honest, I, I remember seeing something about that one time, and I just can't remember what it is. So... Um, no, it, it, was, it was just a question, it's just because after we all have a dip, different way of working, but uh, I set up everything properly at the beginning. So I yeah. want to have everything clean, nice and set up, then after I feel. Yeah, yeah, I think, and, I, and, and I've seen a use case like this before, and we'll talk about it in iteration. I know there's a way to do it. I just right now off the top of my head, I can't think of it. Post that question, post that question in the Slack so we have a... So we have a record of it, we can look it up. Um, Cause you got me curious now too. Cause I know I've seen it. I just can't remember how to do it. But that's a good question though. Um, excellent. Uh, so that's tribbles. Um, so some things when we're creating slash using tibbles, know a couple things about this. Uh, the function tibble never changes the type of the inputs. So remember going way, way back when we were talking about the tidyverse one thing that it, anytime that we run a tidyverse function, it never, ever, ever changes our data. It only changes it when we assign it to something new. And so the same thing with the tibble. It never changes the types of our inputs unless we specifically tell it to. Um, tibbles never change the names of variables. So it won't try and fix names for you. Uh, tibble never creates row names. And so some of you who maybe use data frames before, you remember that it would sometimes give like a one, two, three, four, five. Like that was an actual physical thing that was created for that object. Tibbles don't do that. Um, the other thing is tibbles allow the use of non-syntactic names. And I, I stole this example from the book, but we talked about syntactic names going way back to like the first or second week. Um, again, if it doesn't, if it starts with a number, uh, like an escape character, of some type, it's non-syntactic, and R doesn't like non-syntactic names, especially with objects or variable names. Uh, well, I'm going to break that rule because symbols allow you to do that. So, if you would like to have a column that's a smiley face, 
you can do it. If you uh, <laughs> if you like to buck the norm a little bit, you can have an empty one if you wanted to. I don't know why you would, but you can. Um, being somebody who looks at data all the time, if I ever receive a column like this, I would pick up the phone and I'd say, hey, uh, you have a column that's on name. Um, I would probably use some other words, but anyways, uh, and you can have a number. The, the biggest things that you got to be concerned about uh, when you do this is that if you're going to use a non syntactic name, you have to use backticks. And backticks are just underneath your escape key. And so uh, just use a backtick if you want to use a non syntactic name. Also, know that if you import data that has non syntactic names, it will automatically apply these backticks to it. And so make sure you're aware of that. Um, some things to, make, to check if those backticks are being applied. Run that glimpse command that we talked about way back or run names uh, on your object because those two functions will show you that those backticks have been appended to those names. And so um, you can run those. And uh, if you are going to use the tidyverse, you know, tibbles are at the core of it. So uh, I'll just be frank. Get comfortable using them uh, because you're going to use them quite a bit. Um, so just get comfortable using them. So some other things that you want to take into account when we talk about tibbles, and we've talked about this already when we talked about the differences. Um, the printing to the console is different than a data frame. Uh, they use what's called a refined print method. So it looks better, or I shouldn't say it looks better because data frame has some of its, its things, but it, it provides a better look of like information about your data. Uh, rows and columns will fit on your screen. So empty cars wasn't long enough row wise, but uh, for data frames that have like a lot of rows, it will cut it off and then give you some more information at the end about what columns are available to you. So it's basically just like a, a, a pretty way to give you a preview of what your data looks like. Uh, you talked about data types are reported. And the other thing that's really nice, excuse me, what's really nice about this is you have flexibility to change the output. So if you look at the documentation, if you type in this into your console package question mark tibble, it will give you all the different options that you can set. So if there's a certain way that you'd like to have your tibble actually print for you, you can you can set that up. The other thing that's different is, or the other thing that's out there is a little bit different between tibbles and data frames are the behaviors that happen with subsetting. And I don't think we've talked too much about subsetting. So these are some new tools that you'll be introduced to. But you can subset tib tibbles using uh, a dollar sign or double bracket notation. Um, the book also talks about single bracket notation, if I remember right. But the two general ones that are used are question mark and double bracket. And so we'll talk about those here in a second. So does anybody have any questions or what questions do you have about tibbles versus data frames? I will also say that uh, I may be kind of, uh, I don't want to say talking bad about data frames. But data frames do have their use, and there are certain places that data frames are used, and so they're just different objects for different use cases. But since this book is mainly about the tidyverse, we have to kind of really know tibbles. And so, don't think I'm talking bad about data frames because they definitely have their uses. Um, so subsetting. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to create some tables. I'm going to create some tibbles. If you want, you can really quickly write these down. Um, I'm just going to share some examples for you. Um, we got time, so I'll give you a couple minutes if you want to write these in. Um, but these are the tibbles that I'm going to start with to kind of give as examples when we talk about subsetting. So I'll give you a couple minutes to write that down. And if anybody has any questions right now, it's a great, great time to ask questions or make comments. <clears throat>
And so two things that you want to notice is this top one is creating a tibble, and then this bottom one's creating a data frame. And you can give me a thumbs up if you if you got this written down. Again, I know I'm moving kind of fast. So if I need to slow down, just, just tell me. And those uh, those functions extract five um, five data elements from a uniform distribution and a normal distribution, right? You got it. Yep. They're just creating some random values for us following some distribution. The biggest thing is is that we're just creating some numbers so I can show you the difference in the behaviors and subsetting based on a tibble and a, a data frame. I'll give everybody about. 30 more seconds. Okay, so, uh, so let's kind of talk about subsetting here a little bit. I'm going to share some examples with you. Um, and some of the behaviors that are a little bit different between a tibble and a data frame. And so when you look at these examples, anytime you see this object prefixed with tibble, it's the tibble object. And anytime it's just the DF, it's just DF. And so um, subsetting is just basically pulling out our data. And so it's pulling out a different um, sample of our data. And so anytime that we use the dollar sign with a tibble, we are, it's going to do an exact match for the name of the actual variable. And so if we go back here in our tibble DF, what we've created is we've created a column called ABC. And what this is doing here is it's actually pulling out that ABC column and creating a vector for us. Now with tibbles, this is an exact match. So if the column was named something different, uh, it won't pull it out. So this has to be exact. The behavior is the same for a data frame. However, a data frame, if you use that kind of dollar sign to subset data out of that data frame, data frames will allow you to do partial matching, while tibbles will not allow you to do partial matching. So what am I talking about here? Say if we decided that we wanted to pull ABC out with a tibble, we can't just do dollar sign A. Data frame allows that, allows that because it does partial matching on the name. However, tibbles, they're surly, they're opinionated. You need to have an exact name before they actually get pulled out. Okay. And so if you try to do this, you're going to get a warning that says, hey, this column doesn't exist. Because again, it's opinionated. It's it it only is going to pull out exactly what you tell it to do. You said I want column A, so it doesn't exist. Okay. Some other things that are out there. If you use double bracket notation, so double bracket notation is another way to subset data. So again, pulling out vectors is if you use double bracket notation on a tibble. Again, we're looking at our tibble object here. You can pull by position. So say we want to pull out ABC as that first column, we can use the number one. Um, going back to kind of week two, we got to be careful with doing this because our data might change. But you, want, you might want to be a little bit more explicit in this case. So you can use the actual name itself. And I, and I would suggest that. But there are cases where you could use it by actual position. Data frames do the same type of behavior. Um, you can use the one as the position and you can use ABC as well. So this is pretty similar if you use double bracket notation. And then if you want to use the pipe, you can use the pipe in this case. Uh, so with Tibble, if you are going to use the pipe, what you need to do is you need to use the placeholder with the period and you just basically do it with a period and then you subset with the dollar sign ABC, or you can do it with double bracket notation of subset as well. Um, but you can use the pipe with this different type of subsetting if you would like to, but you just need to know that you need to use that period as that placeholder. Okay. I have a question about the 
the square bracket. Sure. If we use a single square bracket, I see that it gives output in the form of a column. But if we use double, it gives the same output, but as a vector, I guess. So why is that happening? Do, do we know? Does someone want to someone wanna jump in? Uh, I'm, I've experimented around with it a little bit, and I don't have it all straight in my mind, but it's that's that's the just the behavior of it that the double brackets um, will dive it will dive down one extra level. So that extra structure, if you use the single brackets, then the vector has that extra structure of a tibble around it. But then if you use the double brackets, it breaks down that tibble structure and results in just a vector. So, and I think it would work the same way with a with a, like a, an element, like a single um, a single value, where it, it uh, using the double brackets breaks out breaks down that that tibble structure and turns it in just to a single value vector. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's how I understand it. Um. So the one thing that I kind of understand with that too is, is like if I think the book was also trying to get at the different behaviors between a tibble and a data frame. So if you try to do the single bracket notation on a data frame, its default behavior is to always do a vector. Uh, wait a minute. I might have to go back and look at that again, but there was something with like th that if you did that single bracket notation with the data dot frame, the behavior isn't always consistent but with a tibble, it's always going to return a tibble. It's not going to just necessarily return back a vector. And so that's why you need to use this double bracket notation because it's that default behavior for a tibble is always going to be a vector. And somebody correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I vaguely remember that in the book. I knew there was something with just the different behaviors, especially the difference between the data frame and in the actual tibble itself. Did I answer your question, Mansa? Did Ryan's input, my input help? So cool, awesome. So the next thing, uh, we talked about pipes. You can use pipes. Again, you're gonna have to use your um, the actual period placeholder. And then, uh, just like we said before is is because tibbles are just a mod it's just an, a modification of a data frame it still holds those attributes of a data frame so you can convert it back to a data frame if you need to use it in a function in a package that isn't tidyverse related so to do that you can use this as dot data dot frame function it will take that it will take that tibble and turn it back to a data frame for you Again, the book talks about this. Again, if you have a function that's outside of the tidyverse that only takes in data frames and doesn't work well with tibbles, you have this function available to you to convert it back. Again, going back way to the start, tibbles are just a modification of your data frame. And it still holds that data frame attribute, but just tibbles just add different attributes to it to work with the tidyverse or to make it easier to work with tidyverse functions. And then... I think that's everything that I have. Yep, that's everything. So questions, comments, we got done a little bit early, so that's always good. It's just that it's, it's, tough. it's tough to understand. You know, I'm coming from um, base R. So I learned R before learning Tidyverse. So, uh, and for me, a data frame is a data frame. You know, it's, I always use TF, DF. So I never use them. I, I never make it. There is a difference, you know, I'm sticking my whole way and, uh, but it works. So maybe it's just a question of generation to call that, you know, because I haven't really understood the difference. Yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to know what was so bad about data frames but I feel like you would have to work with data frames for years and get frustrated about different things and, and to finally say, we need something new and, and create a tibble. I mean, yes, I, yeah, I especially because, for it, but. <laughs> because I use a label data frame with attribute object. So 
uh, for me work it's easier to think like it's a data frame so i can use the some other information from the data that you don't have in table you know it's just, it's all the labeling stuff so it really depends what kind of what kind of data you are working with mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I came across because um, the importing data talks a little bit about more about it. And so um, what was interesting is, is that the Tibble is not just the end all be all data structure for all data analysis. And I came across this blog that talks about non tidy data, you know, and there's different data structures that are out there that Tibbles aren't necessarily suited for. Um, and this is way beyond what I get paid to do, but like stuff like matrices and stuff like that are multi-dimensional data. Tibbles don't necessarily, I, well, I might be walking on thin ice on when I say these things, but they may not be the best for that type of data. And so, and I think if you read through some of the, the documentation on it, the Tibble is not just trying to be like, hey, this is the end all be all product for everything. It's just a modification for you to use. And technically it is still a data frame. It's just adding these different attributes to it to make it look better and to work with tidyverse functions. So that's just the way I view it. We're getting real theoretical with the Tibble. <laughs> I don't know, I just think it's interesting. And, and again, you know, talking about base R, um, I was reading there, I, I should pass this along to people too. There's a vignette about the, like the, I found it just searching it. It's just like the, the foundational concepts of the tidyverse. And they always say like, uh, the tidyverse wouldn't exist. The tidyverse wouldn't exist without base R. And so the tidyverse isn't trying to make it like, in my view of, the, of what I read was it's not trying to replace base R stuff because tidyverse stuff is built on base R infrastructure. And so they work together. It's just a different way of doing things. So. Yes, I would say that sometimes base R is faster. It dep so because I can use both, sometimes it's a bit, sometimes it could be faster when you just have one, what little thing to do, yeah. And I would, I would counter that too. Again, I, you know, Tidyverse isn't the end all be all to all data analysis stuff, but one of the kind of founding principles of the Tidyverse is to make things human readable. And so sometimes when I'm trying to find a solution, I'm looking at BASAR, I'm like, whoa, I gotta, I gotta figure out what this syntax means. And so one of those foundations is to make it more human readable, accessible and transferable. And so there's pros or cons to it. And so I feel like I'm kind of dominating the conversation on this. So if anybody else has any input, you know, please let, let me know. No, it's good. It's good to talk about and good to think about. It. And um, I mean, it opened my eyes to the idea of using both and seeing how, how both work. I imagine you may run into some trouble using different tidyverse packages with just a data frame. And so it seems like the idea of having a data structure that's universal for everything you do in the tidyverse may be helpful. But yeah, but again, I think it just takes some experience with, with both to see what you prefer and when to use each one. So I think we have an interesting perspective on this. And I don't I don't wanna I don't wanna put Morgan on the spot, but I'm if if you wouldn't mind adding in like I'm assuming that you're starting to learn the tidyverse. How has it been from what you learned 10 years ago? Um, I, it's hard because of course I have compounding factors of, I, I know R from before, but it seems like a lot easier to learn tidyverse than originally learning with data frames and so all the all the workarounds you had to do with with data <laughs> frames it seems like you were saying that tidyverse is just more human readable um so it seems like the process of learning and actually getting your data to do what you want it to do uh seems to be going faster um but i have also had prior experience with r uh so that that is definitely confounding so, so there were workarounds. You needed to have workarounds to work with data frames. Um, 
I, from what I recall, just uh, when we were talking about the turning strings into factors for one, like that's just something you always had to remember, right? <laughs> that it was going to do that and, um, and create its own column with the, the numbering um, so that you, you weren't just working with your original data that you read in, right? That you needed to keep in mind that you had that additional column in there and uh, just other things like that. But now you've made me curious and want to dig up all my R code from 10 years ago to see all the little <laughs> nuances that were in there. And I think those are good points. Like, uh, like one thing with base R, and this is kind of going into um, some of the functions you can use, but base R didn't have a native pipe until just recently. And so now with the newer R, it actually has a pipe in it. And so, you know, and so it looks a little bit different. I think it's like a, a is it like a bar, um, bar, I call it alligator, but carrot. And so, um, or greater than or something, but it didn't have a native pipe into it. So, you know, there are some of like the tidyverse stuff going into base R stuff. And so, but I think, you know, I really think that it's just one of those things that they, they both work for each other. The tidyverse doesn't exist without base R. And then some of that stuff that is nice that we can use gets transferred over to base R. But I'm sure there are people that are more into this that have uh, different opinions and I'm open to hearing them. So uh, Hadley, if you're listening to me or uh, somebody who's in the base R kind of camp, you know, tweet me, do something like that. I'd love to hear more. Um, cool, so that's all I have. Ryan, do you want to kind of wrap us up? Um, just in the last few minutes, I guess, thanks everybody again for, for all your time. Um, has anybody given some consideration to import data next week? Anybody want to tackle it? Uh, you know, I can do it because I, because I, it's not how I do it usually. So it will be a nice for me to, to look at it because I only use Avon as a package. So, mm -hmm. but at least I can use Sidiverse to import. Okay, that'd be great. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and I don't know if anybody else has this question, but when I look into importing data, I see read R, read Excel, there's like read.csv. It seems like there's a whole lot of packages mm -hmm. for importing data. And some of them are tidyverse packages and some of them are not. And I don't know how they overlap and which ones are package names and which ones are function names within a package. Anyway, if, if there's any way to simplify all of the options that are out there for importing, or even just say like, this is the package that's best for importing data because it does the most, or it's the easiest to work with, or it's consistent, that would be helpful for me um, because I find myself Googling again, every time that I need to import data, like what it, how do I need to do this exactly? So. Yeah, you know, I think that the main difference is you have some option already set up differently in the read R and in the other one. And after it, depending if you are using European data, you, has, you use the two and some you don't use the two. But, you know, there is, yes, but basically because we all work with always with the same kind of data and after we don't uh, think about it more because it's always the same. But yes, I will dig. Yeah, no, it will be interesting to dig more on all the all that. That would be great. Cool. But Thanks. the Avon package is wonderful. The which one? The Avon package. If you work with label data, data uh -huh. coming from SPSS, at least the Avon package lets you to keep the name, the value, everything. So it just it depends what kind of data you are working with. But if you work with clean data, like I work with from SPSS, the Avon is the one to go. All right, great. 